you um, uh, wrote a piece that came out this morning that uh, is entitled, Why is Russia Decimating the Ukraine Counteroffensive? Is Ukraine making fundamental military errors at the bequest or insistence of their NATO masters? Yes. Uh, you know, the, the lack of combat air is the number one factor. Uh, Russia has, we're in a new age of warfare. This is not like World War II, where uh, sides could move troops, you know, the Germans could move troops, or the Russians could move troops, or the United States, without the other side necessarily seeing it. In the modern world of intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, with satellites, drones, fixed-wing aircraft, it's virtually impossible <laughs> For anyone to move large number of troops or vehicles or other equipment without the other side picking up on it. So your ability to mass forces is limited. Add to that what the Russians employ is what is called net-centric warfare. So in other words, uh, uh, some guy sitting and crouching in a trench up front can relay or be or receive information instantaneously from a drone overhead or for, from some operation center miles behind the front lines. And they're able to integrate the movements of troops, movements of vehicles, movement of aircraft, detecting of, of, of threats, and get all that information integrated in a fully uh, rapid uh, uh, time frame. Ukraine does not have that to the same extent that the Russians have, but worse, they're lacking combat air, which means as their troops advance and move forward, they're not being covered by aircraft that can shoot down Russian threats against those ground troops. So the troops are basically left exposed on open battlefields. And these, and, and these fields that they're crossing in, in Ukraine, I mean, that part of Ukraine is nothing but vast farmland with some uh, you know, forests on the edge or rings of trees, for, let's call them tree fences. And, and so they're completely at a disadvantage. They're running into minefields. They're getting hit with artillery that has already zeroed in or fixed those positions. And the vehicles are being destroyed. The troop carriers are being destroyed. And, and they don't have anything to cover them overhead. So it what is can they do at this disaster. point? What can they do at this point uh, besides uh, seek some sort of a ceasefire? Uh, it's either seek ceasefire or surrender. I mean, they are don't, the troops don't are the troops demoralized, Larry? The Ukrainian troops do they know they're being put into a meat grinder? Grinder? Do they understand that they have zero chance at victory, notwithstanding what President Zelensky says on television? Right. Uh, there, there's a, there's quite a bit of video evidence showing uh, units from the size of 50 uh, up to 150 men surrendering to the Russians, and and to to a man that is the message they're delivering that they're they're being sent into the front lines without adequate training, without adequate ammunition, without uh, adequate 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 weapons, and as a result they are. Uh, they, they recognize they're in an impossible situation and they're turning themselves in. You don't see those kinds of videos cropping up on the Ukrainian side with Russian troops, uh, which would be a sign of, of poor morale on the Russian side. And uh, invariably, in a lot of these videos, you see guys that are almost as old as me. Uh, you know, they're well, they're over the age of 40. Some appear to be in their 50s. And, you know, the, the war is not an old man's game. It's a young man's game. But uh, Ukraine lacks the manpower. And so they've been scraping the, the bottom of the barrel in, in order to get these people onto the front lines. Is uh, General Zaluzhny, for whom you and Colonel McGregor and Scott Ritter and uh, uh, Ray McGovern have some respect, is he still in charge? The Ukrainian uh, commander. It, so far, yes. Although there has been criticism uh, within Ukraine uh, from the Zelensky side being directed at Zaluzhny, blaming him for the failure of this counteroffensive. The finger pointing uh, has started. There, there was a, a press item today out of Ukraine or yesterday saying that it was they're banning press from going forward to cover 
uh, what's happening because they said it uh, jeopardizes uh, oper the operation of the 82nd. Uh, the unit is designated as the 82nd Battalion and uh, the, the or 82nd Brigade. The, the problem with this is if Ukraine was succeeding and if they were penetrating Russian defenses, if they were killing Russians by the scores, if they were penetrating the first defensive line, they'd have the you press out there. Every, every, you bet every dollar you got, the press would be there filming it. There'd be videos uh, rife all over the internet. They'd be celebrating. Well, they're not doing that. And in fact, they're trying to blame the press for the failure of the operation. So, I mean, it's just it's just one other sign of the trouble that Ukraine faces. Do you have a handle on either the kill ratio, number of um, Ukrainians killed per Russians killed, or on the actual casualties, number of Ukrainian soldiers dead versus or, or disabled from the battlefield versus the number of Russians in those categories? For me, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple calculation. Uh, Russia is firing between five to seven times the number of artillery rounds that the Ukrainians are. Okay? Oof. So think of it as if you're holding a gun and you got one bullet, and I'm holding a gun and I've got seven bullets, you might be able to kill one of me, but I'm going to kill seven of you. And it's that, that simple and crude. That's what's going on. And Ukraine, just by definition, by the sheer volume of fire, is suffering significantly more casualties than the Russians. It's not to say the Russians are not suffering casualties, but again, you've got social media and you've got overhead satellites. The number of new graveyard graves being dug, the number of new cemeteries cropping up in Ukraine is readily visible. You're not seeing the same thing in Russia. So the, the, just those two indicators from an intelligence analyst standpoint, tell me that Ukraine is suffering uh, a grievous number of casualties compared to Russia. Here's uh, President uh, Zelensky yesterday, actually, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, praising the Copenhagen government for sending him something he may never be able to use, which are F-16s. When Ukraine needs weapons, you help. And I thank you and, and the, the whole of Denmark, all the weapons you, you are giving to protect freedom. And for F-16s, we agreed it on. Thank you so much. Today we are confident that Russia will lose this war. Look more Hollywood to you than, yeah, than uh, a realistic uh, statement made uh, in a time of great uh, distress. I mean, you and our other uh, colleagues have pointed out how long it will take to untrain Ukrainian pilots to uh, fight Soviet MiGs, fly Soviet MiGs, and then retrain them to fly American uh, F-16s. Um, you're talking about a time where Zelensky will probably be living in his townhouse in Paris or his villa in Miami. Yeah, well, you're looking you're looking at 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 a minimum minimum to just be barely competent a three month training program. Uh, then even if you get the six months, okay, so you got a pilot who can fly an airplane. Well, let's say they've got twelve of these. It's still not a game changer. The, the actually the thing that changes in this is if they can attach some missiles to the, the bottom of that aircraft that are capable of penetrating into Russia, all this does is raise the possibility of Russia striking back at targets in Europe, such as Poland or Romania or Germany or even Denmark, if they're facilitating attacks on Russian territory. And the, the fact of the matter is the Russian air defense is very robust and, and it's very uh, powerful. And so these planes are not going to survive that long. 
They'll, they'll just survive enough to maybe create an incident that's going to require greater retaliation by Russia. It's not, it, you know, this, this search for these miracle weapons that will change, uh, change the situation on the ground is just, it is a sign of the desperation on the part of the West. I want to show you uh, two clips, uh, one of which I know you've seen because we played it for you before. Uh, it's President Biden in Helsinki last month in July, uh, insisting that uh, Putin has already lost the war. And then we're going to follow it with a clip just this past weekend from Camp David by Jake Sullivan saying, no handicapping, no predicting the outcome. Watch this, Larry. There is no possibility of him winning the war in Ukraine. He's already lost that war. Imagine if even if anyway, he's already lost that war. I will say that over the course of the past two years, there have been a lot of analyses of how this war would unfold coming from a lot of quarters. And we've seen numerous changes in those analyses over time as dynamic battlefield conditions change. So what we have said from multiple podiums and multiple briefings remains the same, which is we're doing everything we can to support Ukraine and its counteroffensive. We're not going to handicap the outcome. We're not going to predict what's going to happen because this war has been inherently unpredictable. Uh, what we did this week is formalize through a letter from Secretary Blinken to his counterparts in Europe that upon the completion of that training, the United States would be prepared in consultation with Congress to approve third-party transfer of F-16 aircraft to Ukraine. There have, for reasons I don't fully understand, been questions about whether we were actually going to do that. So to put all of those questions to rest, that in fact, the training will be followed by the transfer as we work with Congress to effectuate that and with our allies. So is the government uh, confronted with reality? Is it seeking an off-ramp or does Jake not listen to Joe. Yeah, no, the, the, they're not a, they don't listen to the intelligence. Look, let, let's take one very clear example of the complete failure of both Ukraine and NATO. The, the Russians under General Surovikin started constructing these defensive lines. There are three lines of them that consist of trenches, pillboxes, dragon's teeth, barbed wire, minefields, etc. So three levels of these that are in southern uh, Ukraine. They started constructing that last October. At no time during that entire construction process, which U.S. and NATO satellites and other ISR could see being constructed, they knew where it was. They knew the activities that were going on. At no single point in that entire process did the United States, NATO, or Ukraine try to destroy or disrupt the construction of those defensive lines. Why? Because if you see that being done, you should destroy it because it's going to create an obstacle for you. Instead, they let it proceed. It gets fully constructed, activated, in place. And now, you know, now Ukraine hasn't even penetrated one of those lines. And yet I know for a fact that some of the senior U.S. military officials are being briefed by people that, in fact, Ukraine has breached one of the defensive lines. I mean, it's just a lie. So you've got, you've got American generals that are lying to themselves. And, they're, and, the, and the, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which ought to know better, instead of presenting really hard-hitting facts, is, is soft-pedaling what's going on. Do you think that uh, war has become so profitable for so many people that uh, it fails to shock or we sugarcoat it? Follow the money. You put your finger right on it, Judge. Uh, so what, what's happening is the United States is taking a bunch of old junk, dressing, you know, oh, we're sending F-16s. Those F-16s are almost as old as I am, okay? <laughs> so mm. you're, you're sending, uh, and I'm older. Well, Larry, you're not old junk. <laughs> <laughs> So you're, you're, you're sending aircraft that's, you know, 50 years age, uh, old, eight years of age or older, and, oh, here's our new stuff. Well, and so, yeah, Denmark, and they're going to give them up. Okay, we'll give you our, our precious F-16s, but we get new F-35s in exchange. So they're upgrading the aircraft. Well, who benefits from that? 
the U.S. Defense Corporations, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Raytheon, you know, go down the list, and uh, really there are hundreds of other smaller firms that are making money off of this. The, the, the cost, this was, was really shocking, the estimated cost of what we're going to end up putting into Ukraine, this is according to Steve Bryan, a former uh, Defense Department, U.S. Defense Department official, $500 billion. Think about that. Our, the U.S. defense budget. The to, to do what, Larry? Budget, $500 billion. That's five, the, in terms of economic aid, military aid that's going into Ukraine. $500 billion. The, when the bill's all said and done in terms of what we've given, what's in the pipeline, and what's going to be given. How could the American talking? people, I, I realize that we have the, the big government war party in Congress which is 90% of the Republicans and 90% of the Democrats. But how could the American people possibly tolerate something like that? No, they shouldn't, especially when, you know, if you're in Hawaii, you get a $700 check for having your home burned to the ground. Oh, mm -hmm. boy. Compare that to a half a billion dollars. Is, Ukraine, our, our, a, is Ukraine a humanitarian crisis? It's beyond humanitarian crisis. So, you know, the population of Ukraine used to be around 40 million. Now it's estimated down to 27 million. So it hasn't been at that level for over 120 years, I believe, going back into uh, the end, tail end of uh, the 19th century. So, and on top of that, the human trafficking, uh, women being forced into prostitution. Uh, so it is just that the society is being decimated in a way and, and it, it put the casualties into the proper context the estimated 400,000 Ukrainian men have died out of a population of 27 million in World War II when the United States had around 150 million people our total casualties in World War II to killed in action were 472,000 so think about that we had a population that was about seven times the size of Ukraine, and yet Ukraine suffering about the same level of killed in action that we suffered over all four years of warfare. This has only happened to him in a year and a half. How is this more likely to end? President Zelensky facing reality or a, a coup against him or the generals just saying to the troops, go home, guys, it's over. Uh, the you, the yeah. Ukrainian general saying to the Ukrainian troops, go home, guys, it's over. Uh, I, I think the most likely scenario is Zelensky is going to be overthrown. Um, the second most likely is he'll be killed. Um, I do not see Zelensky doing a backflip and coming to the Russians saying, OK, let's negotiate. Because I don't think the Russians are in any mood to negotiate. What are the what are the terms? The only terms for negotiation is for Ukraine to surrender, Ukraine to stop attacking Russian territory, and Ukraine to not agree to go into NATO, to stay away from NATO, and provide a security guarantee to Russia. I, I don't see Russia uh, relenting on any of those positions.